Hi, this is Paul. It's time for another Senate report. I've got a conversation in an hour with Chris Green, who I will be speaking with at the um, Northwestuary, the conference that's coming up in um, in Olympia, Washington, in the Olympia Christian Reformed Church. That's the physical location that will be having it in Olympia, Washington. Uh, but that's not a, it's not a Christian Reformed event. It's an event where I will be speaking and a bunch of other speakers. I'll put the link below. That's coming up. Two years ago, I was at Synod, and so I couldn't actually treat Synod on the channel like I would have liked to because I was Synod de delegate, and there's a um, social media thing on that. Plus, I wouldn't have had time anyway because Synod is a is a a sprint of work for for synodical delegates for that week. Last year, I had my son's graduation exactly during the time of Synod, so I could only give it some cursory attention. This year, Synod is sandwiched between two weddings. I've got a wedding. We just had a wedding at the end of May for my second son. And in July, I have another wedding. It's a destination wedding that I'm going to. So I'm going to Europe for leaving for Europe in a couple of weeks. So yeah, I can't really give this the attention it deserves. And in some ways, I feel that some of the most important things going on at Synod are not getting the attention they deserve. And if, if, if anything fits that category, it's this question of global vision. Now, Zach King, who is the current uh, general secretary, now over the course of the Christian Forum Church, there's been a migration of sort of its top official. Now, let me talk a little bit about the structure of the Christian Forum Church, because that matters in this case, because the Christian Forum Church is made up of three assemblies. There's the local church council, there's the classis, which is a regional judiciary that's right in the middle, and there's the synod, which is a bi-national organization. And body matters in these conversations, because each of the bodies are distinct in a sense, and each of the bodies have their own assembly that governs the bodies. So, uh, yeah, I'll have to see how much I can get through. I, I ideally, what would be what would I what I would love to do with these videos is just slowly walk through synod at salient points, picking out things that I see. I am just not going to have time to do that. Um, that's just the way it is. Anyway. What we're looking at is the synodical, is the synod, which is the bi-national, which is the largest body of the Christian Reformed Church. That's sort of, when we think Christian Reformed Church in North America, we think of this community of churches that is in North America that are Christian Reformed, and they are governed by synod. The next level down is the classis, and classis governs this regional body of Christian Reformed Churches. And locally is the council, which governs the local body. And the Christian Reformed Church polity is set up to try to balance the authority and scope of each of these bodies. And as I mentioned earlier in the video about the uh, about what's happening in churches in North America, polity matters. It actually matters a lot. Um, I looked at the Ready to Harvest video, which had the seven sisters, which are the seven mainline. And as these mainline churches, for the most part, are morphing, disintegrating, changing in North America, as the way that they change is very much dependent on the type of polity that they have. Now, the wide... Pick, widest picture of the Christian Reformed Church in North America, I believe the dominant narrative in the Christian Reformed Church, the dominant, let's say, demographic narrative in the Christian Reformed Church has been that of assimilation. The Christian Reformed Church has, since its inceptions and infusions of Dutch immigrants, Dutch immigration over the years, first one before the Second World War, second one after, the first one before the First World War, second one after the Second World War, the Christian Reformed Church has been in a mode of assimilating into the North American context and increasingly becoming like the two main types of churches in North America, which we can talk about, the main line and the evangelical. And there's a lot to say in both of those. Okay, so 
what happened Saturday night was Zach King's State of the Church Address, which has sort of become a tradition. Now, this tradition arose partly during the... The Christian Forum Church used to have an, a, an executive director, but before that it had a general secretary. Now it's moved back from executive director to general secretary. Why? In the late in the late periods of the in the late um, 20th century, there was a sense that the Christian Reformed Church was not as vital as it could be, and in order to gain better vitality, what it needed to do was organize and use, let's say, business tools to achieve goals. This happened at the local level in some churches, often church plants that sort of adopted a seeker methodology. When I say seeker methodology, I'm talking about Willow Creek, uh, Saddleback, this whole group, this new way of doing churches that emerged really after the Jesus movement, children of the Jesus movement, very evangelical, basically kept a, um, a soul salvation picture and a soul salvation mission, but tried to reinvigorate American suburbs by establishing large, big box evangelical churches. That was the seeker movement. And that movement significantly impacted the Christian Reformed Church, especially in the area of church planting in the late 20th century. One of the founders of that movement, one of the pioneers of that movement was Bill Hybels, who was raised in the Christian Reformed Church in Kalamazoo and left the Christian Reformed Church, um, was working at a student ministry of a large evangelical church in northern Chicago, and then that got turned into Willow Creek. There'd be a ton to say about Willow Creek, but don't have the time to do it here because I really have to get this video done by the top of the hour, which is 49 minutes away. And I talk a long time and I have a lot of things I want to get into it. So here we go. The seeker movement reshaped a certain segment of American ecclesiology and polity. When I say ecclesiology, that's sort of the logos of the ecclesia, the church, the, the study of the church. Um, and it also, it, it was very much a, a move towards, let's say, it's, it's an Americanization move into the church. There was a reaction to the seeker church called the emergent church. And the emergent church reacted against the seeker movement, sort of in two, the two dominant forces that left the seeker church were young, restless, and reformed with leaders like Mark Driscoll, Tim Keller, uh, John Piper, and the other were the emergent movement, which sort of echoed the main line in some way. And part of what you can see happening in evangelicalism is that there continues to be sort of a peel off in a main line direction of former evangelical churches. And Nadia Boltz Weber became like the the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, named her to sort of be she, she was sort of what they wanted to point to in terms of this is where we want to go, Nadia Boats Weber. Another peel off of that was um, Rob Bell. Rob Bell plants a church in Granville, Michigan. That's right in the Christian Reform Church's backyard. And that's before he left to sort of go into the Oprah satellite. But he plants a church in, in Granville, Michigan, and attracts certainly a number of former Christian Reformed people because even though many of you have never heard of the Christian Reformed Church, if you're in Grand Rapids or Western Michigan, the Christian Reformed Church is a significant presence. And this was part of the sort of the big box movement that happened when I was at Calvin, where people start going to Calvary Nandanam and other big box churches in Grand Rapids. The Christian Reform Church had a big box church in Grand Rapids early on in Sunshine, which basically used a lot of these evangelical methods. Lou Vandermeer was kind of the pioneer of that, but that, that was sort of the, the seeker ethos that was very much a boomer movement. And, and that, that impacted the Christian Reformed Church. So when I came back from foreign missions in the late 90s, the Christian Reformed Church was still trying to move church planting and, let's say, church revival or turning church around, 
church, turning churches around in the seeker methodology, which tended to have a strong point leader whose job it was to set vision for the denomination. And it was in that time period that where we had a general secretary before whose job was basically to be a manager for synod and to basically be a manager for synod and then the different Christian reform agencies that sort of developed historically out of certain, certain perennial ministry shapes and desires and also certain individuals that sort of spearheaded something in the Christian reform church. A big part of the history of the Christian Reformed Church has been interested persons going out and doing something different. And that thing then, partly due to the mobility of its time, picks up interest in the Christian Reformed Church and then leads to some institutionalization. Christian Reformed ministry in terms of ministry to Native Americans and ministry in foreign fields like Nigeria very much followed on the heels of bigger um, evangelical movements, not neo-evangelical movements, but sort of broadly Protestant Christian national movements where colonial movements that had been bringing uh, Christianity and churches to Africa and to unchurched people groups, what we'd say today that wasn't pagans or heathens, um, board of heathen missions. So that's sort of where uh, the Christian Reform's minist Christian Reform ministry to the Navajo got started. That's where the Christian Reform ministry to the Nigerians got started. And again, these tended to be Christian Reform people that were sort of picking up in the broader cultural vibes what was happening, and, well, me too, I want to go get in that too. And eventually, because the Christian Reformed Church is so family-oriented, so communally oriented, many others got on board and the denomination sort of came with. Now, by the, by the 70s, these agencies were already well-established, and much of the work of these agencies was paid for by the ministry share system. The ministry share system was basically churches, local churches would pay up to the denomination, not just for synod, but for um, collective communal ministry. And so you had foreign missions and home missions was designed to plant churches where Dutchmen moved, Dutch diaspora churches. So this church here... Um, the, the original home missionary interested in this, when he first came to Sacramento, went through the phone book, found what well, looked for Dutch last names, would call people with Dutch last names and ask them if they wanted to be involved in starting a Christian Reformed church. At this point, Ripon, which is south of us a little bit, some people were sort of migrating up to Ripon when, you know, not all the sons can continue to work in the dairy farm or the nut farm. And no jokes there. And, and, and so some would get college degrees and university degrees. And so that's where the circulatory system started bringing in the post-World War II years, Christian Reformed people to different cities in North America, including Sacramento. And then they called all the Dutch last names in the phone book, and at least a sufficient number were interested. Uh, eventually, they bought some land on which the church was. They sort of got in early, and the development was built around here, the development in which I live and many of the people of the church lived and lived, and that's how Christian Reformed churches would start. Okay, So that was before the Civil Rights Movement. Of course, when the Civil Rights Movement takes hold, and part of the story of this church was then the first sort of real devoted home missionary to this work noted first the church was going to be on the north um, east side of town which was predominantly um, a white settlement in sacramento the home missionary found a lot more responsiveness among african americans in this area of town and so planted the church here and so this church originally had a significant a uh, component of African Americans who were interested in an alternative to, let's say, the black churches that were also being planted here. I could talk a lot about that history because, of course, my father's church in Patterson, New Jersey, was part of that, that history. Okay. So, end of the Second World War, churches predominantly get planted in Dutch diaspora, 
going into the 60s and 70s, you have the beginning of racial reconciliation in the Christian Reformed Church that begins to plant churches like what was the Sacramento Christian Reformed Church, uh, Northside Chapel, where I grew up, uh, Roseville Christian Ministry Center, um, uh, Crenshaw, I believe its name was, in, in L.A. So you begin seeing little dots of... Um, they formerly had been chapels, which had sort of been the uh, missionary, home missions, missionary wing in the Christian Reformed Church, lay preaching, this kind of thing. And again, this is sort of a version of what's going on in the broader culture and um, these other little mission efforts. Um, ministry, heathen missionary, so ministry to say the Navajo, would eventually get morphed into home missions, along first with planting diaspora churches, and then um, some of the churches sort of went racial reconciliation, but that tended to be local things. So example, the church that my father planted in Patterson, New, Jer in New Jersey, he had been called there in 1960 to go and transform, which had sort of been a mercy mission to African Americans who had migrated up from the South and were working in industrialized Patterson, New Jersey, and transform that into a church plant. And so um, he was called to do that. But of course, once the, once the civil rights movement gets going, a lot of you know, bigger cultural things happen. And of course, Northside Chapel became Northside Community Church. And it, it took the shape, it took the shape that it had. And, and the tra trajectory changed by the civil rights movement. Similarly to this church, a uh, pastor that I knew quite well who came to this church he was after sort of the first set home missionary, Vanderjack, and then Earl Marlink came in. And Earl Marlink came in here after having some really difficult and uncomfortable experiences in Chicago. Chicago was sort of a hotbed of conflict around this. You can research the Timothy Christian question. Uh, he came out to Sacramento because he wanted to know if African Americans and white Anglos could successfully um, have a church together. And that really is sort of the birth and, in many ways, the heyday of this church. Now, I could do a whole video on the history of this church, which maybe I'll do someday, because it's, it's a very interesting history. And it's not disconnected from these larger issues in the Christian Reformed Church. Okay, so I've sort of been talking about the local level here, and now I'm going to go back to the synodical level here. As I said before, often these what became Christian Reformed Church agencies started with smaller efforts that the larger community decided to come around and say, we want to have a part of this. And so ministry to the Navajo, that becomes home missions. And it starts working on ministry to diaspora Dutch immigrants who settle in different places of the United States and Canada. Uh, ministry in Nigeria becomes world missions, where now sort of the Christian Reformed Church is sort of tracking with many other denominations. And the ways that the Christian Reformed Church is doing world missions is similar to the ways that some of these other denominations are doing other things, with the possible exception that the Christian Reformed Church funding schemes, again, tended to be very communal. Um, the denomination would ask for what in other denominations they would call assessments. The, they, they became quotas for a while. Clay Leibolt mentioned quotas a little bit in his talk about this church growing up, his family had been poor. And in their local congregation, they had basically said, we have this many families, our budget is this much, we're going to sort of assess all of the members a certain amount according to this. Um, and of course, Clay said, he said, you know, my family was poor, so we really struggled for that. Now, there are good sides and bad sides about sort of this communal way of funding that the Christian Reformed Church was doing. The Christian school network that the Christian Reformed Church built was funded on this, that basically, whether you're a wealthy family or a poor family, the local church really made it a priority. Now, that word is important as in terms of what happened here on Monday morning in this synod. Made it a priority so that all of the covenant children of the church could attend the Christian school. And the local church would sort of, they'd have a, a booster club or some such effort to sort of make sure that everyone could go to the local Christian school. Now, a lot of these practices have been changing pretty dramatically in the last 50 years. But this was the system in which I basically grew up. Um, foreign missions was paid by quotas, became ministry shares. World, mission, world missionaries were supported by quotas, ministry shares. And 
for the most part, this is how financially the Christian Reformed Church ran through Synod. In, in that sense, it's, it's not unlike the federal government. So let's say you have city, state, and federal. All right, for those of you not familiar with this Christian Reformed Church language. All right, now let's talk a little bit about this middle group called classes. What happened over time is that each level of the Christian Reformed Church had um, ecclesiastical responsibilities. In other words, what they did. So local churches would practice discipline. They would practice oversight of local ministry. They might have other little ministry projects alongside the church. Like I said, sometimes some of these projects would sort of get swept up and become federalized through the system. And that's how the agencies started. And sometimes they would just stay local. But there's this classical piece in the middle. And, and classis is, has much more variety than the synodical level and the local level. Because the synodical level is the big picture, okay? And that's just big. So everything classis above is synodical. And that can go binational. And now we've got all this talk about world or global, okay? And then local, well, that's local. And again, they pretty much stay local. But this is changing too in during a globalized context that we're increasingly living in, which is sort of the transformation, let's say, of nets and jets, the internet and the cheap way that regular people, for example, the second wedding I am going to is in Italy. My father never left North America and the Caribbean. The only way he went to the Caribbean, because I was a missionary there and they visited us. My father never visited Europe. My grandparents visited Europe, I think both of them only once. And my mother, I make these videos and my mother listens to me and then she corrects me. Um, but they went back partly just to, you know, visit family members who are still in the Netherlands. But they went, of course, to the Netherlands. So, Local ministry, local. Global ministry, global. Classes. What does classes do? Well, traditionally, classes has had a number of responsibilities. Um, number one, examine candidates for ministry. So the way candidates for ministry traditionally worked was you had a denominational seminary that trained candidates for local ministry, but they had to be examined at the classical level. Those examinations used to be fairly rigorous things. They still are, I'm told, in some places, not so much in other places. But classes has a degree of importance in terms of credentialing. Classes is also responsible for financial support of seminary students that go up through there. Okay, So, for example, when I was nearing the end of my time at Calvin, and I was known at Classes Hackensack because I was Stan's son, and I had gone to Eastern Christian growing up, and then I went to Calvin College, and I was going to go to seminary, and I really didn't know why I was going to go to seminary. I was sort of thinking about foreign missions. Didn't really want to be a local church pastor, ironically. And um, so I decided I was going to go to Fuller Seminary because I wanted to get out of the Christian Reformed Church bubble and get out into the bigger world and move to California and so on and so forth. And, but then in my senior year, my fifth year at Calvin, because I had to have two years of Greek, so I only started this my fourth year, so I did it another year, which I really enjoyed because I got to take some extra philosophy courses. I got a course with Nick Waltersdorf. I basically got to take some, some electives that I wouldn't have, that wouldn't have fit into my very strange path through Calvin that included math, engineering, and then history, and then pre-SEM. So that's, I had a lot of different things at Calvin. But I was starting to date a girl who would become my wife, and I she was uh, she was a couple years behind me at Calvin, and it was like if I go out to Fuller, what's going to happen to this relationship? So that got the wheels turning, and then I was in New Jersey uh, for the summer for a softball game, and um, one of the pastors of classes from one of our neighboring churches, who he knew me and I knew him, and he comes up to me and he says. Our classes support seminarians from any shirt tail relation here. 
and you are a bona fide member of this classes, classes Hackensack, we would love to support you to go to, sem to, go to Calvin Seminary. And many classes at that time would maybe only support students that would go to Calvin Seminary or support students much more greatly who would go to Calvin Seminary. It might be a little bit of ministry to money to go to other seminaries. But at that point, too, Calvin Seminary was quite significantly subsidized by the ministry share system. Boy, this story has gotten long. Am I going to get this all done? By the ministry share system. And... Um, so Calvin Seminary was quite cheap compared to Fuller in the late 1980s, the second part of the 1980s. I, I left Calvin College, graduated in 1986. After That's five years. So I graduated with my sister who was a year younger than I was, which was kind of fun for the family. But so basically the aid that Classics Hackensack gave me, I noticed, would cover my tuition at Calvin Seminary. That was not nothing. I was dating a girl at Calvin. That was not nothing. Me and my buddy Mark Van Heitzma, who is the pastor of the church in Olympia, Washington, you can see these connections, that he and I were going to go out to Fuller together because he wanted it. He had, he had already done a year at Calvin Seminary because he, he didn't take four years to get through Calvin College like me. So he had already been a year at Calvin Seminary. And so we were going to go out to Fuller together. And um, uh, and he was just going to take a year in Fuller, sort of as fun, and then go back and finish up at Calvin Seminary to become a Christian for a minister. But, you know, suddenly, basically all my Calvin Seminary tuition is paid, which means I just got to cover, and I, I was a college student, I was living cheap. I was paying a buddy of mine $50 a month for rent in a house that he bought from the city of Grand Rapids for a dollar, basically uh, almost a condemned house that we were living in. And but I didn't mind that. That was fun. Um, and you know, so food, what I ate, and that wasn't I wasn't really a big spendy boyfriend. So um, yeah, I was living cheap. And then most of the money I probably bought books with. So I decided, okay, I'll go to Calvin Seminary, and I'm glad I did. It was great. I'm, I'm living in California now. Going to Fuller would have been a different experience. Who knows the way my life would have gone. But there you see this whole system. It was basically designed to achieve something. And it's also a system that sort of grew up in a very Christian reformed way. Okay. So back to the bigger story. So you have the seeker movement where the Christian reformed church goes from having a general secretary to an executive director. And then just a couple of years ago, sent in 2022 back to a general secretary. And I remember noticing this and thinking, huh, this is interesting. And, and, and in my opinion, not enough people pay attention to this stuff. And I am always disappointed by the fact that while... I'm going to gripe about the banner. In for a penny, in for a pound. Um, I was always... Now, the banner probably knows its audience better than I do. But I'm always sort of frustrated that nobody talks about this stuff. Nobody talks about the, sort of the strategic level of the Christian Reformed Church. And at least in the seeker movement, when you had an executive director, there was an ethos that basically said, well, you know, somebody needs to keep an eye on the, somebody keeps, needs to keep an eye on the shop. And there was a lot of criticism about the executive director position. It's like, what, do we got a pope now? Because again, the Christian Reformed Church has sort of this three-level structure and the synodical structure, what does that mean and what does that do? And so part of what arises in that structure is the state of the church address. Because it sort of arose out of, here you have an executive director and he's supposed to direct these agencies. And, and what happens is that at some point in the 70s, you also had a relief and development organization called World, the World Relief Committee, which was not supported by ministry shares. But they were also doing, they were doing sort of benevolence. They were a diaconal ministry, which meant that they're supposed to be shaped on justice and benevolence. Now, justice was not the um, politically hot button term it is today. And, but world missions missionaries and world relief missionaries, there was conflict. And so they tried to uh, address some of that conflict by maybe adding another little board above them. But then increasingly, there were more and more questions about 
Well, World Missions is getting into radio ministry, and then Back to God does radio ministry, and Back to God has expertise that World Missions doesn't necessarily have, and maybe they could help each other. And then you've got World Renew. In other words, a lot of what's happening is globalization in this whole process. So originally, there was Synod, and then each of these agencies had their own boards, and all of these boards had representation from all of the different classes. That's that middle realm again. And so in a lot of ways, the classes had a degree of ownership over these agencies, but that became an enormous system in some ways because each agency had their own boards, and all of these agencies in these boards were making decisions for the agencies that might not actually connect up with what other agencies are doing. And increasingly with globalization, the agencies are sort of on each other's territory. Because remember... Whole mission started with Navajo and Dutch diaspora and then eventually got into SCORS, an article committee on race relations and uh, civil rights things, and then got into seeker movement. And then right before the end of, of Whole Missions, as it got folded into Resonate, the first director of Resonate was Zachary King. Dum, dum, dum. Patterns are developing decided it was going to do a community development model. And that's sort of when the this big movement of church planting that I participated in in the 90s and aughts kind of came to a close. Now, now I'm not going to attribute that to denominational politics solely, partly because in the broader culture too, that seeker movement was losing steam. And we had been planting churches with that seeker methodology, but what had been happening even in Sacramento was Granite Springs was planted with seeker methodology. River Rock, that be, was planted by Tim Blackman and, and Chuck Dillard at sort of 1999-2000, was planted, they were going to be planted more with cell church ideas. And then um, the gathering, more of a seeker, Ron Vanderwell's mission was more seeker oriented in there, but right connected with him was David Lindner, who was much more a community development model, much more of a diaconal model. And then um, down the road, um, the last kind of major church plant that, that came to fruition here in Classis was, um, was Christ Church Davis, where over in Davis, which is much more sort of liturgical, and, and you could see just in the little efforts of church planting in Sacramento, the development of this just unfolding. So you have some denominational peculiarities, but you have much larger forces happening in the larger church world, in the larger cultural world. So the, the state of the church address got going with, I believe, I haven't gone back and researched it. Kent Hendricks is the one doing all the homework here. Um, I believe it was Jerry Dykstra who gave the first one. Now, Jerry Dykstra had been a second career um, Christian Reform Church minister who uh, grew up in the Christian Reform Church. His father, I believe, was a CRC minister. Um, he had been in the business world and then was in seminary at the same time I was and very much was part of that seeker move. And so he eventually, he, 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 he was in a church in West Michigan that did very well. And then he came out here to California and was in Walnut Creek, the same place that Clay was just interiming uh, recently in my conversation with Clay. And when I came out here to, call, uh, to California, Jerry Dykstra was going whole hog seeker methodology in Walnut Creek. Did it work? Walnut Creek today... Walnut Creek had a significant departure by the URC. It was, was hit pretty hard by that split. Had a Christian school. And now is a church that's sort of struggling. All right. State of the church address. You have basically the chief executive officer of the Psy board, the synodical boards. He's going to sort of cast vision for the whole church. All right. Well, where did that synodical board come from? Back to the agencies. Well, this is probably horribly confusing if you don't know anything about this. She had all these agencies that grew up basically out of individual efforts that had been adopted and brought forward by the denomination. You know, back in the day, 
um, even what I had been, what I've been doing on my channel, hypothetically could have been adopted, and you know, there could have been the um, the Paul Vanderclay YouTube Church Agency. It'd be kind of like that, where some little effort gets a little bit of publicity, mostly through familial networks, and maybe the banner, and then more people are like, well, you know, that YouTube thing, that's that's really become a thing. Maybe maybe the Christian Reformed Church needs to be on YouTube. Oh, that Vanderclay, he's on YouTube. He's a Christian Reformed minister. He he's he's almost at thirty thousand subscribers. Let's make him a denominational agency. I don't think that would work. Wouldn't work today. But that's the kind of thing that happens. So anyway, as globalization continues, there's more and more pressure on, you know what? Maybe all of these agencies should sort of be owned by Synod because they were all ostensibly under Synod, but they had their own boards. That's when they sort of established what had been called for a while the Super Board or the Board of Trustees. And so you had one board, the Board of Trustees, but then it was a little slow to figure out what to do with these other, these other classical delegates to the individual ministry board. So then it was streamlined. And anyway, there's a whole, there are decades of restructuring that went into this. After they got rid of the agency boards, uh, they then realized something that actually having classical representation at the agency level was really helpful for fundraising because every month every you know twice a year or three times a year that classical rep would go to their classes and they would plead their cause for their agency media ministry back to god world ministry um world missions home miss home missions home ministry yada 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 so you had all of this morphing that happened then and all this morphing is in many ways because of globalization and that's really where this thing is going right here with Zach King's State of the Church Address. So, in addition to the agencies, what grew, what has grown in the last 30 years in the Christian Reform Church have been the offices. And the offices have now been molded into a new agency called Thrive. So, Home Missions and World Missions, which I thought were fairly functional titles, got morphed into Resonate, which means, I don't know, um, skincare product, um, um, church audio systems, um, um, musical instruments, I don't know. So Resonate. And all of the, these different little offices, uh, Pastor Church Relations, Safe Church, Social Justice, all these little offices then get brought into one thing called Thrive. And I guess the idea is that the job of this office is to help the churches thrive. Uh, I guess the job of Resonate is to help the world resonate. But it's not a completely meaningless title because, again, via globalization, this is going to be a big deal. Now, a little bit. So you can find... Um, now, now, some of you might recognize the guy with the long beard... If my grandmother had seen this picture, she would have been horrified. She would say, shave that beard, it makes you look like an old man. <laughs> but 2022, Zach King comes into the denomination and, you know, there's sort of a, a little interview. It's not really... A, because again, the, the Christian Reformed Church has sort of been pulling this all together because increasingly they have the sense that Synod really can't be trusted to do a lot of real business. And, and that's not a bad thing. Just today, there was a discussion about pension. And basically, a previous synod basically said, synods are no longer allowed to manage the minister's pension fund because this body can't do a good job. We've outsourced that to the pension board was expertise and specialization. And synod itself decided to do this. So, it's also interesting to note that Zach wore, Zach wore a coat for the interview, but not for the State of the Church address. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, because when I go to Synod, I, you know, yeah, I, 
I try not to wear shorts too often, and all the little scenes, all the little sayings say that Grand Rapids weather is hot and humid right now, and if you're staying in the dorms, you sort of cook in the dorms and freeze in the, uh, freeze in the big buildings. But So Zach's background is interesting because Zach, uh, let's see, there's this little website called the Christian Foreign Ministers Database where you can look people up. And in fact, if you look up my picture, you'll notice I'm not even wearing a tie for my picture because I just basically went someplace, snapped that picture because I was always already a missionary intern. And, and yeah, you know, good old, good old lefty me. I was going to, you know, continue to celebrate the revolution by dressing down. But uh, Zach, you can listen to Zach's story. Um, Zach wasn't raised in the Christian Forum Church. His, all of his experience in the Christian Reformed Church has been missionary and agency experience. And this isn't a criticism again. But what he doesn't have is classical experience. And that's important. Man, I'm running out of time. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to jump to the chase here. Zach State of the Church address when you do a state of the church address, there's really a limited number of options of what you want to do. One is, especially in a time of crisis, settle the sheep down. And if you look back over the state of the church addresses that we've got, most of the state of the church's addresses have been, it's not as bad as we fear it is. Okay. A lot of them have said that. The church, the Christian Forum Church is very anxious now because we're in a period of significant enough numerical decline that just about everybody notices it. And one whale of a conflict over same-sex marriage. And so you can either try to settle the sheep down, you can rally them to action. Now, settling them down doesn't really need a strong central target because... You're just kind of settling everybody. It's not that bad. I'm sitting from this point of view, the way I see things, not that bad. All right. Rally for action. So if you go back to my 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 video about Scott Vanderplug and his um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington last year, that was a rally for action thing. We the Christian Reformed Church is in numerical decline, and it's a very evangelical move. And America needs Christian Reformed churches to do discipleship and evangelism all around America. And that's what the cyborg should be focused on 100%. And they passed this, they passed this motion, which was sort of intended to, to really align the cyborg so that any of these agencies, what they really need to be asking is, how is this going to reverse the numerical decline by doing evangelism and discipleship in North America. It's kind of a whole missions thing there. And that got passed. But synods, as sort of a body, is a kind of disorganized body in terms of how well it can see things. And it's quite obvious I'm going to have to do a second video because what it did on Monday morning was it talked about, basically I'm saying it, it, it signed on a boat using the college kids' money while not too many minutes later it was anxious about how well grandma is eating because of the, the pension fund. And so, so Zach opted for Settle the church down and celebrate. So seeds of renewal. And then gather. We have these, we have these gathering, these conferences that, um, that people, well, then they had technical difficulties, um, which, 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 never, which never sort of leads people into competence. And, uh, you know, poor Zach has to figure this out. And then we're going to get into sort of the globalization thing. But before that, you know, oh, young, young people, they're all... They're all um, resources and tools for pastry ministry with L L L T B T Q. They they left out the gays. <laughs> Some people are going to say, "Darn right," because, but 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 right here, this was sort of a kind of a. <laughs> 
th that was an interesting part of the speech. And and the only comment is someone who who noted there that said, you know, yeah, he's he's certainly trying to blunt that conflict. Um, but then for me, seeds of global vision. How much time do I have? Oh, I have hardly any time. Oh, I'm gonna have to de treat this. Stuff. What's interesting is that where is this vision coming from? Is it coming from classes? In many ways, it's very Christian reformed because it's coming from a few individuals that have a vision for something and they're sort of getting adoption. But what's interesting is that as Synod is increasingly anxious about its future and its funding future and ministry shares, they're launching an entirely new initiative that is based, um, that is based mostly on classes. And what's funny is that classes in many ways is the least staffed, the least funded, the most chaotic level of the denomination. Some classes like in Grand Rapids, they're just you can drive from one end of the classes to the other in a few minutes. Other classes like here out west, it's going to take you 6 or 7 hours to and longer if you sort of think of geography but if you just go between churches four or five hours between two churches and a class some classes are even bigger you have to fly in there some classes have a couple of thousand people some classes have five six seven eight thousand people some classes have almost no money at all other classes you know if they need money they've got a surplus it's astoundingly diverse. Now, again, if you say diverse, everybody thinks, oh, ethnic, racial, reconciliation has overtones like that. Well, that's not the kind of diverse I mean with respect to classes. As a synodical deputy, I've had a chance to visit a lot of classes meetings. And I'll tell you, it's sort of getting raggedy out there. And um, even in my own classes, COVID was took a real toll in classes. And I think our classes is, is just starting to recover. Um, but... What's interesting is that what he's saying is that churches of the world are coming to North America. They are. And so what we should do is have classes. Let's see if I can find the picture. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, there, uh, uh, there it is. This is Southern California. Classes meaning that it was at. Just a little hint into where I'm going to go because I'm running out of time. So they say, global mission, classes. Now that's not synod. <laughs> now a lot of those people are working in all three. The top, not so much. Classes is going to be the is going to be the point of the spear for global missions. And it's suddenly like, wait a minute, I thought we had an agency for that. Synod's going to offer resources. Well, really, what kind of resources? How much resources? And then it's interesting. Committee six A. That Senate affirmed the importance of its global mission so that the financial and human resources needed for the continued work of denominational staff, leaders, and volunteers in this effort will be prioritized. Oh. Well, the funny, you know, and, and the way that, you know, Synod sort of as thinking of it as a body with a mind and a consciousness, these kinds of things just sort of get passed through drowsily. And, and one of the one of the elements that really caught my attention in this speech is he's talking like. You know, this global vision is a synodical vision. And it's like, this is a staff vision. This is an agency vision. This is actually Zach's vision. And I'm not seeing a great groundswell. Now, maybe in some classes, and I, you know, I was in Southern California when they were talking about these things. And they're like, we're going to add 20 churches in Venezuela. And I'm like, do you watch the news? Do you know what's going on in Venezuela? So then they had they sent one thing in front of the synodical deputies and we swatted that down because it had no credible relationship to church order. And then at the last meeting, they did an Article 8, which is basically bringing in a minister from another denomination and as a Christian for a minister, and he's called by a church in Southern California, but he lives in Venezuela. And what he is is sort of the bishop over a, a really significant, large, growing cluster of churches, to the best of our knowledge, in Venezuela. Super guy, 
His theology was very much in line with the Christian Reform Church. I mean, in many ways, this is exactly what the Christian Reform Church wants and needs in North America. And it's happening in Venezuela, distressed, poor place of the world, distressed, you know. So there's a ton to celebrate with this. But nobody's asking a bunch of really important questions. For example, a little bit later when they got into the pension conversation, one person stands up and says, what about commissioned pastors? No, 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 that's, that's, um, that's, that's already taken care of. Oh, okay. Is it? We made this guy, not, um, no, through these people, because that's very North American office there. But Classa Central, Classa Southern California made a minister of the word in Venezuela. And what happened after that? Did the, did the denominational pension office send papers so that he could participate in the CRC pension fund? Now, this will get into a whole long conversation about the evolution of the pension fund. And again, as I said, used to be pension funds used to be supported by ministry shares. And a while ago, some churches don't pay hardly any ministry shares. <laughs> and, and it was noted that, wait a minute, you've got churches on the books who have ministers who are going to be in this pension program. So then a number of years ago, the Christian Reformed Church changed and said, for a minister to participate in the pension fund, his church needs to be paying into the system. Because otherwise the system isn't going to be able to continue. And they did that. Is his church in Venezuela going to pay U.S. dollars into the pension fund? No. No, he won't. No, it won't. At some point, somebody's going to raise very popular words like colonialism and diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's already a rumbling underneath the commission pastor position with respect to pension. The pension conversation basically was this is a safety net. And when you retire, you're not going to have anything like the salary you had when you were a minister. And the salary is averaged over the course of the United States. So if you want to retire in a place like California or a place like Michigan, it's going to be different. And then word came up, is this a conflict of interest for Christian foreign ministers to be voting on their pension? No, we actually took this away. So I guess it would be a conflict of Christian Reform ministers to be on the pension board. So on one hand, on one hand, Synod this morning basically said, we like global missions and Classis is going to pay for it. Even though they have zero expertise and very little money. Okay. But this is going to make us feel good. But by the way, we're really worried if grandma's going to eat. And it's like, And the thing that I really took notice of was Zach saying, this is a synodical vision. And I thought, no, this is Synod being drowsy and voting for priorities when the next conversation over is going to be about very big, complex things that are changing the economics and the demographics of the Christian Reformed Church. In other words... I don't think we're having an, an adult conversation about globalization, about what's happening in the Christian Reformed Church. And again, I don't think we're structured to actually deal with this well. Now my time is up. That was a really messy video, but I recorded it and I'm going to put it out.